The Phoenix team has put out some very interesting things with Phoenix 1.7 and LiveView 0.18. Chris McCord talks all about it during his ElixirConf keynote, and we will take a look at that keynote now, and I will try to summarize what I think are the most interesting and important bits. I'm Lars Wikman, and this is Underjord. And finally, we were like, no, this actually sucks. And Jose was like, what if we just did this? And, and that became Phoenix Verified Routes. Basic Phoenix routers, like, it's not e intuitive to figure out what the route helpers are. So we added them for a good reason, but they are not very intuitive. I recognize this. I've had my fair share of problems with route helpers. I never remember them. My editor tends to lose track of auto-completing them. In the end, they don't save me much time compared to just writing out the path and building it myself. So I think this, this is a really valid thing to address. But the thing that made me realize that verified routes absolutely should replace route helpers is when I put the slide together, I left off the new action, that new atom, and I didn't realize it until I was rehearsing. So like, as a firmware creator who made this pattern, implemented it, in the framework and has been a user of it for almost nine years now, I got this wrong my first try. That's a good argument for them not being intuitive right there. Yeah, checks out. But when it comes to live routes, I get this wrong and it's just nonsensical. So we can do better. I'm glad he's saying it and not me, but I've never felt that route helpers and live view particularly get along. So yeah, I share that experience. Verified routes are a sigil-based um, string, and what we do at compile time is we will actually dispatch that string against your router and give you a warning if we didn't find anything that matches. So instead of all this arbitrary routes passing arguments, you just write a string with a sigil p. Same for this, you know it's post slash id slash comma id, you just write that. So I can say sigil p post, I interpolate just like string interpolation, and it's way nicer. Uh, but it's even nicer than that. Because in the case of live view, like, like those functions are so verbose and complex, but the path is just user slash ID, right? Like it's such a simple path. Why do we add this indirection? Because we can just say slash user slash user, like, and we're done, right? There's no more thoughts. This is exactly what I end up doing when route helpers disappoint. So this should fit me perfectly. And in addition, the compiler in the system can check that I wrote them correctly and that the paths actually exist. They can save me from typos and somewhere. Seems great to me. And it's aware of query strings. So like route helpers to do query strings, they took an optional argument on the end. And for us, no, you just write the string, right? If you want to add a literal query string, you just do question mark page, you interpolate the value. And the compiler, at compile time, we see the question mark, we know a query string starts there, so we can encode the query string properly as it should be. Or you can give us a dictionary and then we encode that uh, a map or a keyword list as a query string param. Being able to pass keys and values like that to create a query string as you've constructed some kind of filter, that's going to be fantastic. I think verified routes overall is going to be a great addition, and I'm not even going to have to clean up all that much in my projects because, you know, I don't end up using route helpers all that often. We have declarative assigns and slots on top of live view that give you some compile time niceties that I think really give us kind of like this next level of the component ecosystem that we can build up around LiveView. I think this was like the missing piece to really have. Oh, the missing piece. So this is what this looks like. It's a regular function component where you write sigil h heeks. You can write your documentation like general, but you annotate these things with macros. And you can say, I accept a row ID. And we have this idea of global attributes as well, which we'll see uh, in, in a moment. And you can accept slots, and slots are like a way to have a component accept arbitrary markup or other uh, component calls. So instead of just passing like strings all around, you may want to say, well, in my table, I actually want to put arbitrary content in there, and that's what a slot is. And you can say exactly what this component accepts, whereas LiveView 017, it had to be embedded in whatever documentation you happened to write, and you found out at runtime that you were wrong. I haven't spent enough time with components to actually have felt this pain, but I know slots are useful. I've used view, for example, that has them. And I think this way of sort of self-documenting and slightly structuring what a component takes in is good. This all looks good to me. Container used to have to this add this verbose function basically everywhere. 
But now you can just say, I accept these attributes. Um, the name is required. So at, run, or at compile time, it's going to tell you you messed up. And then this global attribute is basically any attribute that's not declared here that is also a valid HTML attribute we support. Being able to do attributes in this way, super useful. Just being able to, for example, provide defaults to a component and also being able to specify which attributes it actually takes in so that you can get support from the compiler and from the Heeks tooling to help call components correctly. I think this is going to be great. Heeks formatter for HTML that I didn't have to write. Uh, Felipe was kind enough to just go off and do this. Um, not asked for, I, I wasn't necessarily sold on formatters at the time. And having used it, I can't imagine not having it. Yeah, HTML formatting within Heeks is a fantastic thing to have. I've already tried this plugin and I really like it. It really helps when you're working with something like Table and UI where you bring in pretty large amounts of markup that's already formatted in a particular way where you want it to format consistently. And also it helps if you have large HTML documents and it saves you a bunch of time where you just don't have to bother with formatting yourself. Great addition. Uh, we added live uh, generation to the authentication system and it was like a ton of work. I think like 80 files changed. Uh, so <laughs> thank you Berenice for sticking this out. This is good news. The Phoenix Gen Auth system already generates authentication code that works well with LiveView but it doesn't use LiveView for its UI. So the login screen, the account settings, the invites, all of that UI is dead. It's like dead of use. And this should be a better experience overall. It might even improve the integration between the auth and LiveView. I'm not sure if it makes any changes there. I've definitely settled on using Gen Auth rather than POW or any of the other auth libraries. I've particularly struggled trying to get POW working well with channels and LiveViews and it just wasn't worth it. It was too much effort, it's too reliant on cookies, and cookies don't play nicely with LiveView necessarily. I also like the fact that when you use GenAuth, you then own your authentication code, which means you can change your authentication flows and adapt them to your application very easily, because they are just part of your code base. Making the UI of GenAuth smoother by using LiveView should be a clear improvement in most cases. Uh, Tailwind. So Phoenix 1.7 will include Tailwind by default. So like I said, the, the worst is better approach. Um, you can treat it like mid-2000 CSS, Chris, with writing bloated CSS, except you're going to get the optimal thing on the outside. I've heard it be said that CSS inherently trends towards becoming technical debt, and that CSS is the only code in a project that just grows linearly with time, and not with effort, not with feature work, but just time. Over time, your CSS will be growing just due to problems with reusing. And fundamentally, CSS is meant to have this semantic concepts and like this power of reuse and mixing different classes to build different things. But all in all, I've rarely seen it work well. Often the classes get so tangled up in the specifics of the app that changing one class that's been heavily used just means that you'll break everything and you have to check your entire app over because you want to make one new UI. And then that means instead of doing that, you add a new class. It's the pragmatic thing to do in that situation. But it means your CSS just keeps growing. And Tailwind avoids that by not trying to reuse the semantics. You just essentially write these classes that build out a sort of almost inline style. And that gets really messy really quickly if you do it to a whole document or a whole app. But if you constrain it to components, it's actually quite nice because then that component knows everything it needs to know about styling itself. It's similar to how, for example, Vue will pack a style sheet with the component. What you write day to day in your UI once you define these core set of components is something like this. And this is actually what the Phoenix Gen HTML and Phoenix Gen Live generators generate for you. Highly composable and reusable. And the beautiful thing is our generators with milligram before this generated a ton of markup with minimal classes, but classes here and there. And they weren't reusable. The moment you wanted to use Bootstrap or even Tailwind or Balma, the generators became essentially useless to you. But now the generators will be they continue to add value because I could just go implement header, simple form, and modal in my app, and I imagine the community will end up doing this. 
Uh, we'll generate, out of the box, you'll get a components EX file with your base level components that you see here, plus a couple others. And then if someone wants to do Balma or Bootstrap, they'll just implement those functions for you. I've felt the pain of cleaning up the default styles of a Phoenix app several times. I often start new experimental projects. And sometimes it's because I want to use Tailwind, and sometimes it's been because I want to use something else or use nothing at all and start from scratch. But removing that inherent styling has been a bit of a pain. Componentizing this, making it so that you only have to dig into those particular components is a pretty nice way of having some good and useful defaults with using Tailwind, but also making it easier to change if someone wants to use Bootstrap or whatever. So I think it's a very smart idea. And they've done it instead of having like a no tailwind flag or something for the generators. And I think that's a cleaner design in some ways. It might be controversial, but I think it's useful. I think it's a decent approach. And a big thing I'm focusing on Live View 018 is accessibility. Client says, ah, it's not really important, so it doesn't get done. So even if you care deeply about it, you don't have the time or resources to do it. So what we've done is we've shipped a couple primitives to at least help generate accessible uh, experiences out of the box, because I think LiveView shouldn't just be like a good way to build applications, like we should be good web citizens and build the best applications we can that serve everybody. I like this approach. When you're building software, there are so many priorities and so many things to do to just get the darn software built. So accessibility often falls away behind or entirely by the wayside. And this two-pronged approach where Phoenix will ship with more accessible defaults and as accessible as possible defaults and generate as accessible as possible solutions for you by default, along with providing all the primitives to make your own stuff more accessible, give you good tooling to make that easy. I think that's a smart play and I love to see it. Is uh, a modal pops up, but then if you tab through that modal, and you tab after the last uh, thing in the, in the modal element, you're left uh, in the page somewhere. And as a screen reader user, the modal's still showing, but now they tab and they're outside the modal and the, the screen reader is telling them about other page information. But the fact that the modal is still there and showing, it's not obvious. Now, this particular approach and generally this particular problem is not something I've thought a lot about and I thought it was really cool. I also realized we had a focus issue with a client just yesterday where a modal pops up and the focus wasn't shifted. So hitting the space bar was hitting some entirely different button somewhere and causing all kinds of trouble. This is good stuff and as my experience clearly states, accessibility helps everyone. It's about making the app as good as it can be. And our generators generate that out of the box for you. So even if you don't care or you don't have time to care, what you get out of the box for a modal will be focus wrapped. And we have other uh, focus niceties, uh, like there's JavaScript uh, JS commands for pushing focus to kind of store where you came from and popping focus later to say, okay, restore focus at a certain point. And there's a focus first function that says, like, just focus the first reasonable thing in a container. Being able to control focus from live view is great. Typically, this would be something where you need to hook into custom JavaScript and things. And this is generally a problem that front-end frameworks have, where they need to handle state that only really lives in the browser. Where is your selection? Where is your focus? What's your current path? And sort of integrate well with that. And one thing, getting proper primitives so we can do a good job of that without resorting to a ton of custom JavaScript, as well as offering like the simplest, simplest thing, like just focus the first reasonable thing in this element, please, because that's the absolutely most common case, like the 90% use case. This seems fantastic. This is actually designed by the Tailwind team. So a big thing that happened recently was I reached out to the Tailwind folks and said like, hey, we want to uh, change the Phoenix generators to use Tailwind, and they uh, were actually kind enough to design and implement the core set of components for us. I really like this new look. It's a good lift compared to the previous one, and I'm not surprised that the Tailwind team did a good job of the design. Whatever designers they have on staff, real good. The things they put out are really nice to look at, seem nice to use as well. Now, I don't use the default stylings and the default generated views all that much, but maybe I should, maybe I should explore that a little bit because I do generate a fair number of new projects every now and then and it would take care of a lot of sort of list, create, update, delete 
kind of things. And they do all this stuff with modals that seem pretty convenient. Perhaps something to explore further, especially now if they're pretty. So here we have the roadmap. The storybook thing is a kind of recipe book of components that exist within your app where you can play around with them, show them, experiment with different states. Those seem like really cool solutions, especially for establishing sort of this is how we build our app, this is what our app looks like, and be able to experiment and build out that. Streams of ongoing data streaming into a live view is not something I've had to deal with, but it sounds like an interesting problem. I can see how that will work for, for example, a CI/CD kind of service where you're streaming the log of the build, for example, or chats as well, I guess. Yeah, I'm curious to see what they do there. Unifying how live views and live components do messaging sounds like a reasonable thing to do. Also sure that that might simplify the work with, for example, the programming live view book that Bruce and Sophie are working on. I don't envy them working with such a moving target. And I'm sure they'll hold off until it's a little bit more stable. Stable as in unchanging, changing less before it's finalized. But I'm sure it's going to be a good book. So check it out, even though it's not done. Um, complex forms really suck. Uh, we've known that for a long time. Uh, I have some ideas. It's been on my list. Uh, but that's my probably next big thing to work on. Complex forms really suck. You heard it right there. That's not exclusive to Phoenix, honestly. But I think Phoenix can make it better than it is. So very curious to see what they do there. The roadmap also mentions template files for function components. I get why that's something some people would want when you're building larger function components. It can be a bit annoying to have functions and template at the same place. It hasn't been a problem for me, but I get it. It's probably a good idea. If you think about what a function component is uh, with an, inner, with an inner, um, inner block of content, it's just a uh, function that takes a inner slot. So like a layout just becomes literally a def layout, a bunch of markups surrounding a render slot inner block. And that, that, that's a layout. Like we can remove a, a concept entirely by just having a function component. If turning layouts into components removes an entire concept from Phoenix the framework, all for it. Can we get rid of view as a concept next? I don't use them for anything. No, but more seriously, it seems like components and uh, layouts have an entirely overlapping feature set and that layouts are just a subset of what a component can do. So yeah, makes sense to simplify things and just use components instead. Makes sense to me. I hope you enjoyed my summary and rundown, my takeaways from this keynote. If you want me to do more of these, just some talks in the comments. I'm happy to have sort of ideas thrown at me. And also thank you to Chris McCord for giving the thumbs up for me to go ahead and do this. Thank you to the Phoenix core team for all the work that you do. Much appreciated. If you want to know whatever I get up to and when I publish new things, sign up for the newsletter. It's more reliable than anything YouTube puts together. And there will be a link in the description. Until next time, stay curious out there.